Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar uh, from Everbridge CMS Ready Emergency Preparedness Drills. My name is Lisa Johnson, and I will be joined shortly from Dr. with Dr. Goldman. Uh, and the reason why we're here today is we're definitely talking about drills and best practices for drills, but we are only eight days away from the full implementation of the CMS Emergency Preparedness Guidelines. So this is something that a lot of our clients are concerned about. We've been getting phone calls for months about this, getting people up to snuff with the CMS Guidelines, and Steve Goldman will be covering that today. Speaking of which, <laughs> Steve Goldman is a senior lecturer from MIT, uh, and he is joining us today. He's internationally recognized for business continuity, crisis management, disaster recovery, crisis communications, and you spend quite a bit of time working with hospitals and other um, entities putting together drills. Welcome, yes. Steve. Well, thank you, Lisa. Glad to be back. So what we're going to go is a brief introduction. I'll talk about the CMS preparedness guidelines, uh, a little bit of what surveyors are looking for. We found out it may be a little early. Then talk about how to get started on the drills and exercise portion what resources you have, my top five points for successful drills and exercises. Then once you do the drill or exercise, now what? Just can't sit back, reflect on the glory. You do have work to do. Then I'll pose a couple of final thoughts. Then I expect a standing ovation from all of you sitting at your desks and cubicles. Okay, a couple of caveats. First of all, no two hospitals are the same. No two health facilities are the same. And even within a hospital, organizations can, can vary. So please, Adapt the information in this and all webinars to your specific organization, your specific hospital. So we've assumed that you've got your crisis plan, you've got your incident response teams, you've got your incident response facilities, and you have a communication plan. And a really nice thing to have would be an emergency notification system. And I'm not saying that just because Everbridge is sponsoring this. In my experience, people need an emergency notification system. Okay, so we talked about incident command. This is the basic incident command structure that you could set your hospital up with. Uh, the next slide shows you the hospital incident command system in a little more detail, and don't be afraid by that. It's uh, quite a lot of information, quite a lot of, um, of positions, but do not fear, adapt your hospital, your facility to something like this. And this is what we have at MIT. We have uh, top right is the policy group, the senior people, the emergency operations center, and then our emergency organization. Over to the left are external partners, which would be, um, in, in MIT's case, hospitals, EMS, Cambridge Police, Cambridge Fire, and then the incident command post where the first responders are directed from. So you see how it all comes together. So something like this for your organization works for us, would work very well for you. All right, let's talk about the guidelines themselves. This is the, um, the website where you can find this, and what we're looking for is paragraph 482.15. Those, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven major topics. We're looking at topic D, training and testing. I've underlined a few things that are important. Under training and testing, basically you have to provide that annually for all your uh, people. And we'll talk about that in just a second and it uh, must be reviewed and updated at least annually. The training program, as you can read, all new and existing staff must be provided some kind of training. Annual training, you have to maintain the documentation, and part of that is demonstrating staff knowledge of the emergency procedures. Testing, you must conduct two, well, I'm gonna, one drill and one exercise. Uh, under the I is the full-scale exercise that's considered community-based in other words, you do this with members of your community response. In other words, hazmat, fire, police, uh, EMS, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what you need to do with them. Or if you have an actual event, you can take credit for that. And it all has to be done in one year following the actual event. The second thing you have to do is they want you to do an additional exercise. It could be a second full-scale exercise like you've done before, or just a tabletop exercise. Sit in a room with all the relevant people, discuss the event, throw out the scenario events, talk it through, go on to the next event, talk it through, and challenge what's in your emergency plan. Finally, you have to analyze your response, and we'll talk about that near the end, about your after action report. 
and of course revise your hospital's emergency plan based upon what you found. In the guidance it says, and this is good for you, the uh, requirements for uh, these provider supplier blah 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 will be individually surveyed to your specific training and testing. So in other words, if you're in a group of four other hospitals, they will only look at you and not the other three. They will judge you on your own. So this is very good when you document your exercises. This is a reference down at the bottom of the page. My suggestion, first of all, is document everything. It doesn't take too long. The first year you do this, it'll take some time. After that, you just follow your documentation. So develop your policies. Make sure they're defendable. In other words, why do we do this? Why do we only uh, train these certain amount of people? So use the guidance as your basis. Have reasoning behind making your decisions, whether I'm going to comply with the gui guidance or I'm going to depart and deviate from the guidance, and here's why. Capture them in what I call a governance document and stick to them. A a for example, it might be on your training and your drills and exercises, it says you will train all staff, all hospital staff. Well, that includes your groundskeepers, for example. Now, you know in a real event, your groundskeepers will probably be considered non-essential people and be let go or not required for the response. So you might make the, um, the, the, the uh, supposition that we will do training but not to do groundskeepers because they won't be around, they will not be involved. So you document that, let it go through and see what the surveyors say. I think you've had good grounds for doing that. So in other words, say what you do and do what you say. Now, I reached out to the seven official government uh, contacts in the guidance and they talked to eight hospital contacts and not one of them got back to me. So it might be too early to go to what are the details that the surveyors are looking for. Lisa? Uh, and, and to that point, uh, we are definitely hearing a lot of people in a bit of a holding pattern. The Joint Commission, um, a lot of their surveyors are going to be doing the CMS surveys. So you'll probably be seeing familiar faces as they come, as you come up for your surveying process. It's, it's on a three year cycle, as I'm sure most people know. Um, we are uh, bringing somebody on board in about a month uh, to do a webinar, and he is training the surveyors. So um, his job is to train the people that are going out into the hospital systems with their checklist. So we're going to be getting some inside information from him. Um, just be open uh, to that webinar. It'll be in your mailboxes in the next couple of weeks. Great. So how do we get started? First thing, look at the proverbial big picture. You have your plan, and I recommend based upon the guidance, a three-year drill and exercise plan. What are you going to test over the three years? You can't drill and exercise everything in one year, so you spread it out <coughs> excuse me, over three years. From that, you develop your scope and objectives for your drill or exercise. That gives you your evaluation criteria. That helps you write your scenario. Conduct and critique the exercise. Have your evaluation of what did you learn, what did we I need to improve. Go back and go back and validate and fix and revise your emergency plan. So that's the cycle I would recommend. Okay, where do you begin? Well, why are you doing this? One, because you have to, and two, because it's the right thing to do. So getting started, you need management support. Again, make, making your case. Clearly, hospital support. Uh, external agencies, work with them for support and participation. Uh, you need to gather up your personnel materials, your permissions, facilities. I'll make a joke about donuts and meals, but as we'll talk about later, if you feed them, they will come. And understand that most of the participants in your drills and exercises are volunteers, whether they're forced or otherwise. They are volunteers. They're taking time from, if you will, their real jobs to come work with you. So understand that, appreciate that, make them feel wanted. Uh, carrots and sticks. Um, yeah, we have to do this, but we're buying lunch. Uh, it's the right thing to do, et cetera, et cetera. You'll come up with those. Then finally for you personally, you can read the list. Flexibility, anger control, leadership skills, teamwork and management skills, uh, documentation system. You need an attention to details because they will grab you during an exercise for a lack of a detail. Uh, an aspirin, a drug of choice, and you've got to have a positive outlook. If you don't believe in what you're doing, if you don't lead this, nobody else will. So you've got to show them that positive outlook, the value for what you're doing. Okay, what resources do you have? Fortunately, you've got a lot. And uh, there's a half a dozen or so websites you can use to help you with your, uh, your quest. The first one, the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program 
HSEEP, as it's called, uh, gives you all the basic documents. This is a reference in the CMS guidelines as a good place to go for information. So it'll tell you how to develop and conduct a drill, give you templates, give you scenario ideas, ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And at the very bottom of my list, reach out to your local responders, reach out to your state and federal responders. They were more than happy to help you work with that. I've never seen a local responder say, no, we're too busy to deal with the hospital. So reach out to those people. So my top five points for uh, drills and exercises. Number one, scope and objectives. And we'll go through each of these individually. Two is a development team. Three is your scenario. Four is your participants. And five is conduct and critique the exercise. So let's look at scope and objectives. The scope defines your exercise. How large is it? Who is participating? And more importantly, who is not participating? What facilities you will be using? And what facilities, et cetera, you will not be using? So you're defining your scope. The timing, the day, the schedule, logistics, how much is simulated, how much is real, and to what extent will you be going to simulate something? Will you, for example, actually use your emergency room for um, a drill scene or simulate using that? Um, will you actually shut down your computer system or will you simulate that? And I'm pretty well guaranteed you're going to simulate shutting down your computer system. But this is defined in your scope. People consider exercises tests. Let's go with that. So if you consider your exercise or drill a test, your exercise objectives are your test questions. So you also need to know the answer. So let's go through a couple. Uh, the way I like to format it is you set out your objective. That's your test question. How do I satisfy this objective? Here's your answer. Now, what limitations do I have, if any? How far do I need to go to answer this question? So let's look at a couple of examples. So objective, objective one, demonstrate staff knowledge of emergency procedures. Hey, this comes right from the CMS guidelines. How do I document that I've done this? This is it right here. Responders will participate. A tabletop drill designed to challenge responders, plans and procedures, and we will document participation. Very straightforward, but it's your documentation way of proving you've done this in your drill. Analyze the response and maintain documentation of the drill. Again, this is directly from the CMS guidelines. Numbers one and two are the same thing. Number three, you'll develop a formal after action report and improvement plan, which will analyze hospital response. So that'll analyze the response and help you maintain your documentation. So there's your objective. Here's how we satisfy it. In this case, no limitations. Objective number three could be demonstrate the capability of your incident manager team, or whatever you call it, to mobilize in a timely manner on a real-time basis. Here you've got a procedure which tells you the team should be pronounced operational within 15 minutes of the crisis declaration. This comes right from your procedures, so there you go. That's your time frame, that's your limit, and you don't have any limitations and you want to use your actual command center and equipment. How? Demonstrate the successful implementation of the new Everbridge notification system. So how do we satisfy that? Responders will use the notification system, make sure it works in accordance with their procedures. Now, I actually ran this at a hospital drill a couple of weeks ago. This exact objective now satisfied. Our limitations were all communications must begin and end with this is a drill. And then we use targeted contact lists for the drill. So we use it specifically for the drill, contact list one, contact list two. Nothing external was done. It was just an in-house drill. So we made the limitation that no external notifications are to be made. And finally, demonstrate the ability for the security team to evacuate the emergency room. If this is what you want to do, this is your objective. In this case, though, we're not going to actually evacuate the ER. We're going to do a procedure and have the uh, security develop how they would do it, scan through the emergency room, figure out what they're going to do, and they have their procedures to do this. Let's make it happen. So the interface with any non-drill participants has to be prefaced with this is a drill. You do not want your security team running into the ER, making it look like they're going to evacuate if people are thinking that it's real. Definitely not. No patients will be uh, used, um, used uh, moved, I'm sorry, and nothing else will occur. Uh, how do we do this? You put together your scenario development team. This is my second point. And these are listed internally and externally alphabetically. And these are the people you use to develop your drill, use them you know, if it's an IT drill, if it's a facilities drill, uh, nursing and medical staff, get them on board 
and work with them. Externally, you can read the outside organizations who will work with you. And the best part about this for your internal team is they can become the controllers for your exercise, the facilitators, when you run your exercise. This is the, uh, this is the caveat you have to do. For every document associated with the drill or exercise, make sure that it is stamped, imprinted, uh, you name it, with the words for training use only. I, can, I could do a whole webinar on drills and exercises that have had problems, not mine of course, but have had problems uh, by people thinking it was a real event. So again, make sure every document is, is stamped or uh, uh, says for training use only. So for your development team, what type of disaster do you want to use? Well, your exercise objectives will tell you if it's going to be IT, security, physical, finance, or risk, for example. Now, in our business, it's rare. It's only in our business that we would call events like this typical, but we do. So if you want to do a drill, hey, snow, hurricane, tornado, ice, uh, you can read through these uh, human-caused emergencies, workplace violence, major absenteeism, a strike, tech disasters, data breach, uh, network down, a hazmat problem, and of course a public health emergency, a, a pandemic, a mass casualty, or a disease outbreak within the hospital. Now hospital-specific events could include problems with patients, problems in a dedicated room like intensive care or the emergency room, a lab problem, You've got an open campus and open spaces, visits that are everywhere. You can make all sorts of disasters occur with and through them, including the next one, criminal activities. Family notifications, you want to do that. How do you do that? Test it, make sure it's done right. A good old employee scandal uh, is always one to do, but if you're testing, say, physical security, that might not be the one you want to do, but plenty of opportunity to do that. And finally, a regulation violation. Uh, that should get most of your senior manager involved in dealing with that. So you can use several of these different things for your uh, drill or for your exercise. Then finally, if you're a children's hospital, you would want children's hospital specific uh, problem, uh, special laboratories or veterans hospitals. Again, you'd want them specific to your hospital. So be creative, go out there and do it. And here's a piece of information. Healthcare suffers an estimated $6.2 billion in data breaches. So if you want to test something that's real and relevant to your hospital, uh, do a data breach. I just ran several of those. I ran data breaches and ransomware at hospitals, and it was really, really fascinating, the results. I'll talk about that near the end of the webinar. So after you get your scenario, your team together, this is a template you can use for your timeline. So a time, event, and any comments. Let's go to the next one. It's partially filled out. So you can see initial conditions, something occurred that drove the community to activate uh, some explosion in the emergency room, for example. Also need to compromise the data center. So now you're just gathering the ideas and putting them on paper. And you can read through that. Um, uh, at 10.15, for example, there's a data center problem. Don't know what it is at this time, but we will figure it out. So this is several iterations that uh, you're going to be doing. Serve lunch, and then we conclude by 3 o'clock. The uh, semi-final timeline would look like this, much more detail. In this case, we, we can have a small explosion in the, uh, the emergency room, commence the exercise, and again, I'll let you read through this on your own time. We did do a, um, uh, a, a ransomware, it uh, looks like 1015, so we can do that, and that, again, presents lots of funds, fun for the hospitals nowadays. At 1130, we posed that one of the employees passed away. How do you handle that? Uh, you know how to do when patients pass away. How do you do it when it's one of your own people? Uh, it's very interesting. Okay, let's move forward. Your participants. So the responders you use from your emergency plan. And uh, what I recommend is to halfway during a drill or an exercise, do a shift change. You get these people once or twice a year maximum. So do a shift change and get from team A to team B or team primary to team backup and get everyone involved. Controllers, again, ensure that the exercise proceeds as planned, injects the messages. You can read through all that. They make sure people outside the drill or exercise don't um, uh, become involved. And they record the action successes and the improvement items. The evaluators um, independently observe the exercise 
and they actually also should act, uh, evaluate the scenario and the controllers as part of their report. Now, um, one thing you can do is use people from audits or risk management to be your evaluators. Or what I like to do when people are kind of at a premium, the evaluator role is combined with the controller role, so you have a controller evaluator function. Observers are there with your permission to watch what's going on. They may interact with the controllers, but not with the responders. And if you want them to observe and participate in the critique, that's fine. That's your call. And finally, non-participants, which is 95% of the rest of the hospital, basically inform them about the exercise, keep them out of the way. Some logistical items. Throughout all of this, safety is the number one priority. Do not compromise safety for your drill. The minute something appears that it's going to be a problem with safety, safety is the number one priority. Use your command center. Use your actual layout. Uh, I talk about food. If you say your drill is going to begin at 9 o'clock and you provide donuts and fruit and coffee at 845, everybody will be there at 840. Get the food at 845 and be ready for 9 o'clock. Otherwise, people are going to be in here at 9, 915, and you don't want that. Make sure the procedures and plans are available or people have them on their uh, laptop or mobile device. I always recommend desk placards with position titles. Everybody knows who everybody is, but they don't know necessarily what position they have in the exercise or in the uh, real event, so always do that. Something I find, waste baskets, I think it's a security thing, are getting rarer and rarer, so make sure people have waste baskets in these rooms. You can read the rest. And what else does your, phone, your plan say? We'll have phone charges, we'll have a video conference, that's fine. And finally, if you can, provide lunch. Again, it's a nice thing to do for your volunteers. The only thing experience has shown me is do not make it buffet style because everybody will get up at the same time, walk over, and make it a social event for an hour. You don't want that. Just a box lunch, chips and a Coke, there you go. And again, I'm repeating myself, but it's very, very important. All documents must say for training purposes only. Make sure you publicize the drill of the exercise and make sure the people in and around the hospital know that it's an exercise and not a real emergency. So I googled uh, emergency signs, drill signs, and these two examples came up. You get these large scale, post them around the drill, post them on, on, on flip charts, post them wherever to make sure people know in an emergency scene that it's part of a drill. And the reason I'm showing you this is because if you saw this, along uh, Scott Boulevard in Santa Clara several years ago, you would think, oh my God, what is going on with this company? We've got a major problem. Well, there you go. They're showing people that it was a training session in progress for the emergency response team. So nobody called, no one had any hassles, everything was, was cool. Now, a warning. If you're going to do a workplace violence event, a druggie breaks into the emergency room, demands drugs, make sure that it is well controlled and people know that it is part of a drill. Here's one example, and I've got a dozen in different industries where consultants come in, they try to run a drill, they do not engage people telling them this is part of a drill, no signs were posted, uh, and if you want to read for that later, uh, people thought they were going to die. They gave the, the, uh, the uh, mock druggies, the drugs, let's see, it says four men wearing masks, carrying guns into the emergency room, at a hospital that demanded drugs, took hostages, and terrified people. No one told them, no one told the people they were part of a drill. I just can't believe that. And again, I've got a dozen examples of that in different industries. Okay. At schools, another one. Uh, teachers shocked and frightened at the schools hold an unplanned, get this, an unplanned shooting drill. How can they do that? These people thought it was real. They huddled in their classroom according to their procedures and gunmen, gunmen burst into the meeting room holding 15 teachers, get this, firing blanks. So again, a little common sense when it comes to this. And you can see that there's going to be problems because the lawyers are going to get involved. Uh, this is an article from a couple of years ago. And finally, the media finally realizing that a surprise terror drill can be dangerous because real people may respond and start shooting at the mock responders. So again, control the heck out of something like this. Make sure people know it's part of a drill or an exercise. You can add to the realism. You can read through that. Um, you can have damage. You can pour water or sand to simulate spills. Moulage victims. I uh, you know that moulage is the um, 
the makeup and the the uh, the um fake wounds. fake the fake wounds. There we go. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and the, even the bones sticking out to make it look like a real event. Um, you know, disabled systems. You can travel to the hot site. Something I've been doing a lot of is um, mock YouTube, mock Twitter, and mock Facebook uh, posts about your crisis. Believe me, that gathers people's attention real fast. Okay. Now, point five is conducting critiquing the exercise. You should do briefings prior to the exercise. And I don't see why you can't consider that your annual training if you meet all the criteria in the CMS guidance. So. Uh, your drill starts at 9, from 9 to 9.30, 9.45. You consider that your annual training. Then your drill starts at 9.45, 10 o'clock. So why not? Again, say it in your documentation. This is what we're going to do. I've got the people here. Why not? I always can train controllers and evaluators. I provide leaders with leadership training. How do you respond when you get into the, uh, the command center? A lot of these are doctors, hospital administrators. Don't know the, and they're very good at what they do but don't, don't know the first thing about leading uh, a command center. So I do that type of training. I pre-stage the people and the props, set up uh, all the exercise they task, then start the exercise. And your exercise can start one of three ways. Um, the day is going on, life is good, nothing's happening, then bang, something occurs. Or the event is underway, now you start your exercise. Or the event's over with, the data breach is done and gone, you know, it's still there. Now you start your exercise. So it depends how you want to do it. Control the exercise as we've talked. Conclude the exercise when you either met your objectives, all the objectives have been run through, and there's just a couple you're not going to meet, and that's just the way it is. So go through and do that. And finally, conduct your critique, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Hey, guess what? The so best practice of safety is the number one priority. So don't forget that. Some best practices. Define your exercise. Define your scope, objectives, and goals. Um, some people in exercise and drills appoint others to take their place because they're too busy. Don't do that. Um, the participants are actual responders. Make sure that the real people are there. And make sure your scenarios are realistic. And you can have Godzilla come from you know, Narragansett Bay and stomp on your data center, but that's not realistic and you're going to lose people. So make sure your, your, your problems and your events are realistic, and they challenge everybody. Nothing is worse than sitting in a room for two to four to six hours doing nothing, watching other people respond. So yeah, you may pile on the stuff during the day, and it's going to be a real bad day at the hospital, but make sure everyone's challenged. Facilitators guide, they don't lead. In other words, if you're a facilitator and a player says to you, what should I do next? Hey, what would you do if this were real? That's your response. You don't tell them what to do unless they are really, really in a bind, then you can help them out. Have a known exercise co exercise stop code for a real emergency. Then, had this happen, you're in a hospital, a business or a nuclear plant, and something really happens, so you have a special code, code blue, code one, code stop, make it simple so that people know the exercise is either stopped or over, we've got a real event to deal with. Talk about it this, oh, uh, the other thing I don't want people to do is, well, for this drill, I'm going to do this, but if this is real, I would do that. You know, do X or do Y. Uh, why aren't they doing Y? Uh, make sure that they know why they should be doing what they're doing, and don't just play for the drill. And the words I do want to hear from facilitators are, what would you do if this were real? Do your evaluation, and we'll talk about promptly following up, making progress. Okay. Where have I heard these best practices before? Oh, yeah, about 10 minutes ago. Understand that your people are volunteers and you treat them with that respect and work with them. Don't waste their time. Have all the flexibility, all these personal skills you need to make this work. Again, make sure that uh, all your documents say training or say, I'm sorry, for training purposes only. And again, make sure safety is your top priority. In a drill or an exercise, you can do a message like this, which says message for, say, the Incident Command Center from security, we just saw a car drive into a chemical truck in our parking lot, and that would trip off uh, uh, the, the exercise event. Or you can do what I did, next slide, go out and buy a car for $25, place it underneath a truck full of water, and say that's your initiating event where we have a chemical spill on a hospital property and a car crash, 
And if you notice on the right side of this slide, 1993 is placard art, placarded for hazardous uh, material, you know, explosive material. So people know, again, it's part of the drill that um, uh, that's what they're going to be dealing with. And if also you look at the slide with 1993, you look. Oh, can you go back? Yep. If you look just below that, you'll see two feet. Those are mine. I got the pleasure of opening up the drain valve to start off that event. So those are my feet. Okay, carry on. Using Twitter messages, any format that you want. Um, this one I just pulled because uh, I can use the Twitter logo, have a picture, and Acme Hospital on fire, hashtag Acme. And again, you see I have for drill use only. And the neat thing about Twitter is you don't have to, you don't have to spell anything correct. Do what most people on Twitter do is just misspell the words. It makes it more realistic. Uh, this is a personal thing of mine. When you're doing your evaluation, people call it a hot wash, which is a term from the Army uh, about cleaning their, their rifles after uh, military work. Um, I don't like that because people have enough to deal with. They don't need to learn a new phrase. Uh, Postmortem from mortem from Latin 101 means after death. And I don't want people thinking of my exercises as death or death-like events. Call it evaluation. Call it an assessment. Call it a critique. When are you going to do it? Right after the drill or exercise. Don't waste anyone's time. Go right into it. Begin the exercise and go for it. How do you do it? Discuss your, your format. We're going to do it this way. Here's how much time we have available. What I want you as the leader to do is summarize the objectives, summarize the scenario. Then just start at your left, go all the way around the room, and um, get everyone's feedback. First players, then maybe evaluators, and then finally you. You've got to keep this moving, otherwise people will be doing the critiques for hours. And what they're going to try to do is solve the problem. You don't want that. Identify the problem and keep it going, otherwise you'll be there for all day. Summarize that we met 18 and 19 objectives and conclude with praise, encouragement, commitment to do an action plan, and thank everybody for participating. A couple of pointers. As always, every exercise, every drill is going to be good training. We learned a lot and we need to improve communications. Those are going to be three items I guarantee you're going to have. When there's a criticism, you need to assess whether it's, you know, it's valid and, and not take it personally, or someone's being political and trying to get to you or denigrate the drill or whatever. So that's an evaluation you have to make. And keep an honest and open mind about this. There may be more than one way to doing business. But just watch out for career suicide. Don't pick on an officer or an executive and say, you did a lousy job, Jim. Uh, we'll try to fix that. You do want to have a job the next day. And finally, emphasize the positives. You did a drill. You did an exercise. A lot of good things would have come from it. And what I call opportunities for improvement, not bad things, not problems or errors, opportunities for improvement. That's what I call them. The best critique I've ever seen was this one, official blaming God for chemical spills. You've had your uh, successful drill, you've had your successful exercise, now what? You need to develop an after action report. And this is my suggestion on the uh, layout. So the introduction is everything you've already developed for your drill or your exercise. This is documenting what you've done. Then comes your evaluation. An overview, did we achieve the objectives? What did we do? What did we not do? What did you find? And then what are the individual evaluation items? They come up with your improvement plan. And just so happens we have one right here. This would be my suggestion for a template for your improvement plan. The reference number is just whatever. The observation, the recommendation, the resolution, the comment, who is responsible for it, what department, when is the due date, and then the, uh, the far right column is what we call the stoplight chart. Red means it's not started, yellow means it's underway, green means it's done. So you can sort this. If you put it on an Excel spreadsheet by responsible person, responsible department, the due date, or the status. So this is a valuable tool for keeping yourself, your group, and management informed as to where you are on your improvements. Now, these three items are ones I had at a hospital um, within the last year or so. And what's interesting was the, uh, that everybody had key contact information. And everybody said it's in a, it's in a procedure. Well, where's the procedure? Well, it's on the network. Well, what if the network goes down? 
well, gee, let's have it on our cell phones. Great. And so now the, the process, everyone is going to have uh, the emergency response staff informa contact information on their cell phones. The second one was just kind of, that was kind of weird. The emergency, uh, the emergency uh, so incident command team leader was late getting into the command center. Then he got focused on some equipment problem and he didn't activate within the procedure timeline of 15 minutes. So this is hardcore numbers. You can use this in your evaluation report. He just made an honest mistake. He wasn't deadly. And so we just do some training that people need to activate as soon as possible. Third one was interesting too. Hospital built wing after wing and uh, the PA system kept up with some wings and not with others. And so they, during the event they wanted to use the hospital public address system for uh, emergency notifications and communications. People didn't know how far it went. Uh, did everyone get it? Uh, would it go into the emergency room? Would it uh, go into the patient's room? So no one really knew. They just used it as a matter of course. So now they have to do some study and look at the system, figure out how much can we use it? Can we maybe make a, a segmented system so that uh, only certain people get it? So they had a lot of work to do, but it was well worthwhile. Now, I've got to give you one more that came up two weeks ago. We did a loss of network, and the um, the backup is go to the go to the forms and go to the procedures. Well, they didn't know where the forms and procedures were, and then interestingly, um, a lot of the younger staff. Um, when it came time to filling out a form, they had no idea how. Everyone was on a, an iPad, a laptop, and no one knew how to fill out a paper form. And it was an amazing piece of knowledge. That, you know, the older people said, just go to the form. The younger people going, what forms? What's a form? And so that hospital is going through a training session now on how to use forms in case we lose power, in case we lose a network. An extremely valuable um, item that never would have come up without the drill. Using the leverage from this exercise, strike while the iron is hot. You've got federal guidance behind you making sure that you've got to get this done, and that's good. But after a week or two, managers are going to lose interest. Honest to God, that's what's going to happen. So you get about a week or two, put your action plan together, get management approvals to move forward. Do not squander this opportunity. It comes once a year, maybe twice a year if you're lucky. Now, what do you need to get done? What do you want to do? What's the next step? A larger exercise? You need new equipment. Um, this thing about the forms was a major item. And, you know, obviously revising plans. But again, you've got it. Management's on board. Don't squander it. Okay, my final thoughts. I like doing drills and exercises. I find it's the most fascinating part of doing crisis planning. And you get to meet people. You get to work people. And then when it's all over, the hospital uh, response is improved from two or three hours before when you started it. So I get a lot of personal, professional pride out of doing it, a lot of satisfaction. From your point of view, it's not easy. It, it, it's hard work. You've got to be ahead of the people. You've got to come up with real good and realistic um, uh, items or, you know, disasters that you can use. You know, a drill could take a month. A large-scale exercise could take up to six months if you're really uh, doing it. Obviously, you need senior management support. You've got to have your desire to test your program. You can do a paper drill on PowerPoint, check off the blocks, be done with it, say to CMS, yeah, I did it, and, and walk away. And yeah, you can do that, but it's, it's not meeting the intent of the guidance. It's not really helping your hospital. So again, do what you have to do. Really test your program. Attention to detail. And then the best part is creativity, foresight, and leadership. This, is what, this, is, this to me makes it all worthwhile. You get out there, you do it, and uh, you just make your hospital a better place for your efforts. Get out there and do it. I know you can do it. Any advice or any information you want to talk, give me a call. I have a lousy website. If you want to make fun of it, go right ahead. But give me an email. We can talk about any of these issues or anything that comes to mind about this. Lisa. Steve, thank you so much. I very much appreciate your time today. That was very thorough. Um, and you did this presentation for us uh, about a year ago. And there's some quite a few changes and updates since then. So thank you for all of that information today. Um, we are going into the question and answer period now, so I'd really like to see your questions coming in um, while you guys are preparing them. Yes, we did record the webinar for today. We're still recording, and we'll be sending that out along with a copy of the slides and other resources, just in case anyone was wondering and came in a little late.
there's one thing that I do want to talk about, and that is Everbridge currently covers 23% of all hospital beds in the U.S. So chances are, if you are looking, um, if you're looking to do an active drill, for instance, where there's a patient evacuation, if your hospital doesn't use Everbridge, and it very well might, the hospital you're sending your patients to might be using Everbridge. Um, and that's not including the extensive use in state and local government. So we are the number one emergency communication platform um, in the United States for all of healthcare. So when a crisis happens, what do you need? Well, the most important thing is you need to know where your employees are. How do you get a hold of them, both if they're on duty and if they're off duty? If they're off duty, can they get to the hospital? Um, are you going to need to cover for them if they're not? You're also going to need to think about things beyond cl clinical care. You're going to need facilities, security people. You're going to need to think about your medical supplies, um, food on hand. Uh, according to CMS guidelines, you need 72 hours of um, supplies and food, so how are you going to handle that? Do you have it in place? You need to be able to track all of this stuff. Um, CMS now requires documentation. They're going to be coming in. If there's an incident at your hospital, and I'm going to say the 35 hospitals during Hurricane Irma mm -hmm. that had to evacuate, um, the federal government FEMA is right there <laughs> looking to see what happened and they want to know how your patients were taken care of. So that documentation is becoming more and more critical. Uh, you need to think about local responders outside of the hospital walls, fire, police, public health. There's a very extensive list of people you need to think about. And then the picture of those microphones there in the bottom right is meant to, you know, kind of give you guys a wake-up call because if something happens, even with an active drill, the press is going to be there. Twitter is going to be there. People with video on their can on their phones <laughs> are going to be there. So that needs to be part of your planning as you go through this entire process. So how can we help you? Well, we can help you run your command center. Um, the picture up there is from a patient move. Uh, a hospital wing was closing and they were moving patients across the street and this is the command center they used to, to take care of that. Um, we are mobile. We can launch anywhere that you can get a signal. You can pretty much get through. And as we discovered during hurricane season this year, there were a lot of people, even though the cell towers had some damage, they were still able to launch mobile and get things through. Everbridge does have prioritization with the federal government. We are at the same level as FEMA. So if FEMA is talking, so are we. Um, and we also noticed, I, I do kind of want to give a shout out to some of the um, mobile providers. They were doing their ever-loving best to get cows in place, which is uh, cellular on wheels. Uh, they were taking them and putting them into areas that needed assistance, and they were getting mobile operations up very quickly. You're going to need to work with those local responders. You're going to need to think about your local community. Are there... Um, special needs in the community that you need to address. Nursing homes was a big one that came up during hurricane season. How are you going to help those people? Uh, we have an extensive resource library on CMS emergency preparedness. It has everything, literally, you can possibly need. <laughs> um, it can, you can start at our page and go through all of those resources. And then we also have Everbridge General Hospital, which is our uh, test facility. You can come inside Everbridge General Hospital, launch an incident, and you can track it and see how the whole thing works. Um, without uh, accidental, accidentally sending the wrong message to the wrong people at the wrong time. It's a nice contained environment. So with that, I'd like to begin with some questions and uh, kind of bringing it over to something we both touched on, Steve. What, what should you think about with an active drill and the media? Oh, okay. Um, one of the weak this is in most hospitals and actually most businesses is dealing with the news media. Despite most communications departments thinking, oh yeah, it's, every day here is a crisis, so we know how to deal with the crisis. Uh, I say this because I used to be a manager of media relations. I used to do be a spokesperson, and uh, as a consultant, I've just seen a lot of these. What you need to do is get your communication staff involved with your drill, despite what they say. They are not too busy to work with your drill, uh, and if they are too busy, just say, well. You know, we just tell the boss, but whatever it takes, get them involved, work with them to provide them information, and have them actually go through, develop statements, send out Twitter, send out Facebook, whatever it takes. 
you can actually buy or rent Twitter and Facebook drill pages. Uh, there's a name for it. I don't know what it is. Um, we can. It's, it's just yours. The only you people, your people seeing it, are seeing it, and um, you can practice that way. But and then flood them during your drill. Flood them with Twitter messages. Flood them with Facebook pages. And flood them if you can. Pre-make some YouTube videos, and challenge your communication staff. The other thing to do is, uh, at the end of my drills, I like to hold a media briefing, where I take all the responders. Say, now you forget everything you know. You are now reporters. And then the communication staff go up and do a briefing. And that really, it shows people, gee, I better provide the media people with the information because they are really struggling. And it just opens a lot of people's eyes. Another thing I do is if I have a university nearby, I work with a professor for journalism students, bring them in, and they act as the news media for the hospital uh, public affairs staff or communication staff. And let me tell you something, those college kids are tough. They are the difference between them and, uh, and a pit bull is a pit bull eventually lets go. These kids in journalism school do not want to let go. They want to impress their professors and impress you. So that has always worked well. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, and then the next question is, how important is HIPAA during a drill? Very important because if you have a hostage situation or a uh, ransom situation or something like that, the police may ask you for HIPAA, you know, give me all the information you have on the victims, the hostages, and the perpetrator. And your first response is going to be, well, I can't give it to you because that's federally protected. Well, in, in the federal guidance, there is a, a release clause which says for law uh, response purposes, you can release private information, public health, uh, private, privately held information, BHI, uh, whatever the acronym is. You can release that to a law agency, and very, very important to make sure you know you get the get the regulation out, give it to your lawyers, keeps them quiet, then do what you need to do for whatever the police want. Excellent. Thank you. Here's here's one. How many controllers do I need for a drill or an exercise? Um, well, for the drill, you can actually get away with just one, which would be you. If it's a small drill sitting around a table, for a large scale exercise, you'll probably need one for each large area being uh, tested. So maybe emergency response, management, hospital EMS, uh, you know, it could be IT, it could be you know several, several. I've run hospital drills with, with 10 controllers one time because we tested not only the hospital but hazmat and EMS response and police and fire response. So I needed a controller at least in each one of those areas. So um, again, it just depends upon the scope of your drill. Here's one, here's one that works for the two of us. I have an Everbridge system. How do I incorporate that into my drill or my exercise? Okay, very good. Have people use the Everbridge system as part of the drill. Actually use it. Actually go to the the, the web page, go to the, the desktop, the, the dashboard, and actually have them call it out. I've done this several times. In fact, I just ran one at an insurance company a couple of weeks ago. They just got the Everbridge system. Again, it didn't matter what system. It just happened to be Everbridge. And they, they tested it for the very first time during the drill. They learned a lot. Like not everybody has the Everbridge app on their cell phone who needs it. They, they had this page where, okay, these five people will be able to access the webinar. I'm sorry, not the webinar. Access the Everbridge app. They can do it on their laptop. They can't do it at home on their cell phone. Why not? They never got the app. So little things like that, just make it part of your drill. And Everbridge will print out a report how well you did. And that, you can make that part of your drill process and part of your drill evaluation. But yeah, absolutely. If you have the tools, use them. Use them in a drill. Uh, and if I could just add to that, um, any communication platform that you're using, not necessarily ours, any communication platform, you need to get buy-in um, from all participants before the drill occurs. So you, you know, that should be part of the checklist. Um, that all the volunteers get um, is have you downloaded the app or, or do you have the email server on your phone? Whatever it is, the way that you're going to contact people, you need to make sure that all the participants of the drill have that readily available, that they're not scrambling at the last minute for it. Um, okay, and with that, uh, thank you very much for coming in today, Steve. It was a pleasure as always. Thank you. Uh, we will be uh, editing this video and getting out getting it out to you in the next couple of days.
stay tuned. We do have some more webinar announcements coming in the next week or so, so you will see that in your email. And thank you very much for coming today. We appreciate your time, and we hope you found this information useful and applicable in your current facilities. Thank you.